Well, a few weeks later, I get a knock on the door, and it's uh, a social worker from the Department of Human Services, and she presents me a, a letter saying that I abuse I abuse the child. Hey, welcome to Commando on Demand Insider, your fast-paced weekly update straight from Kim's desk to your ears. I'm Mike James. The Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia is the only one like it in the United States. It has a quiet zone that spans 13,000 square miles. And today we're going to talk to a guy that drives around in his truck that's filled with various receivers to track down any interference signals over that 13,000 miles. Plus, even though you're not a terrorist, Homeland Security is probably tracking you. And we have a question about spoofing someone's email, but he also has an unbelievable story about a Philippine bride that you're going to be blown away. This stuff happens out there and you need to know about it. Plus, Kim has this week's hot topic about teens and social media. There's a new study out. We'll take a look. And if you haven't heard about TikTok, it's taking the world by storm. And we're going to find out about it from one of the most successful creators on TikTok, Zach King. And if you haven't heard of Zach's name before, well, don't worry. Your kids have over 33 million followers. He has a three-part book series that was optioned by Steven Spielberg's production company. And we'll find out more about that as well. And every week we find a fun trivia question for you and ask that you give us your best guess without using Google or Surrey or any of the other search engines. Uh, And this week's trivia question is about Apple, the trillion dollar company, but it had very humble beginnings. It was founded by a couple of 20-something college dropouts in 1976. Now, one of those founders was obviously Steve Jobs. The other one is also somebody you're probably familiar with, Steve Wozniak. But you might not know that there was a third founder who didn't even last two weeks with the company before walking out, quitting. And so our trivia question is, what was that last person, the third person's name? Was it George Dayton, Pierre Amidier, Fred Smith, or Ronald Wayne? Yeah, who is the third founder of Apple that walked out after just two weeks? We'll have that answer for you later in the podcast. And of course, Quick reminder, this is not the Kim Commando Show. You can get the Kim Commando Show as a podcast. It's great. Every week, Kim gives you the very latest tech news, tips, DIYs, and we take your questions on the Kim Commando Show. You can listen to that podcast on your schedule. You can watch us record the show live and get many other benefits with the Commando community. And to get that show, just go to GetKim.com. That's GetKim.com. All right, getting started in just a moment with Chuck Naday from Green Bank, West Virginia, the electronics technician who hunts down RFI signals for the Green Bank Observatory. Next on Commando On Demand. Commando listeners know technology moves so fast it's almost impossible to keep up with everything that's going on. That's why there's Commando On Demand Insider. It's our way of keeping you informed and on the cutting edge of technology. Now, our next guest is a electronics technician who hunts down RFI for the Green Bank Observatory. Here's Kim. Imagine living in a place where there was no Wi-Fi, no more checking your email while you're getting coffee, No more instant notifications, no more news alerts. Our next guest lives in such a place, Green Bank, West Virginia. And it's home to the Green Bank Observatory, where you can find one of the world's most sensitive telescopes. This isn't for looking, by the way, but for catching distant signals from across the stars. Now, in order for the Green Bank Telescope to pick up these signals, it's located inside the National Radio Quiet Zone, where no kinds of radio waves are allowed. Chuck Day is an electronics technician at the Green Bank Observatory. And one of his many jobs is to search for signal interference like stray Wi-Fi and cell services that could alter the telescope's results. Hey, Chuck, thanks for joining us here on the Kim Commando Show. My first question for you is, what's the strangest place where you've ever found Wi-Fi hidden in your territory there? Well, <laughs> it's actually pretty hard to keep it hidden. Actually, the the strangest source of Wi-Fi was turned out to be a dehumidifier in somebody's house. A and dehumidifier? I, I, yeah, that's right. A wireless, wireless dehumidifier so that you could uh, turn it on and off and change the settings remotely. I thought that's just too much. 
So, so are you like like the Ghostbusters there in Green Bank? I mean, you go around and you're looking for the Wi-Fi signals that might disrupt the telescope's operations? We go around and we look to see what's there, but we don't try to shut it down because, well, there's various political reasons for that. But yeah, we, we generally do a, a, like a weekly uh, search throughout the area to, to see what's out there and just keep tabs of what's going on. Um, we don't really try to uh, eliminate it unless there's specific complaints about Wi-Fi from the astronomers. So why can't there be any Wi-Fi? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, there can be Wi-Fi. That's that's the thing. Is I mean, there's no rules or regulations that say that you can't use it. The, the rules that are out there say you can't interfere. So if you're not interfering, then it's okay to have it. But we have so many gadgets that are now Wi-Fi enabled. I mean, it's astounding to me. Like, for example, like we have, of course, the smart kitchens. I know you I know you don't do a lot of curling of your hair. I can see that. But, <laughs> but there is also now a Wi-Fi enabled curling iron. So if for some reason that you want, you can't hit the button on your curling iron, you pull up your phone. <laughs> it's crazy. I agree. It's crazy. I mean, they're just going nuts with putting Wi-Fi and everything. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So you have, I saw a picture, you have a truck that's just loaded with all kinds of gear. Yeah. Now, do you drive around the streets or do people say, hey, listen, you know, we're getting a complaint over here. Or we think that there's something going on over here. Yeah, basically, I just drive around and and uh, look for the usual suspects for interference. Um, and then uh, a lot of things that we find are, are purely accidental. We just happen to stumble across a frequency. If uh, an astronomer complains about uh, interference to their op- observations, we try to get as much information from them as we can. And it may be off-site or it may be on-site. And then it turns out you know we're, we're our own worst enemies because to detect weak signals, we have to generate a lot of RFI on our own. So we do our best to shield and and minimize that, but sometimes it sneaks out. So do you have a big teenage population there in Green Bank? (laughs) (laughs) No, we don't. We're losing kids by the the bucketful. Um, That's one of the sad things. We're just not nearly as many kids around here as there used to be. We have one high school for the whole county. Well, you know, if they can't get on Snapchat and Instagram these days... Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and live with those screens. So yeah. so if somebody wants to to shield themselves from Wi-Fi, it, are are you using any of that type of Wi-Fi paint where they where you can actually paint the walls and so that this way the signal doesn't get out? Does that work? We have one um the GPT um equipment room and um uh control room uses a, a paint like that, but we've also got other things in there. I think there's a, also a fine copper mesh uh, that went in and it wasn't completely effective in shielding. What we were trying to do was keep the RFI in the uh, control room and out, out keep it from radiating out of the building. So they, they went in and w- went in with that, uh, that paint you were talking about. And kind of put a coat, you know, put a coating of that over top of the, the copper mesh. It amazes me. Uh, how well Wi-Fi frequencies propagate, like at 2.4 and, and 5 gigahertz, uh, it, it does a lot better than I ever thought it would. Um, and that's from years of doing point-to-point microwave systems at those frequencies. And and uh, and the, the equipment that you used to have to use was just big and cumbersome and stuff. And now it's little teeny boxes that just do all sorts of stuff. Uh, so I just one final question for you, Chuck. Have you ever had to knock on somebody's door and tell them that they were having this Wi-Fi problem and and they said, we don't have any Wi-Fi, and then <laughs> lo and behold, you find out that they do? Actually, I did once. There's a uh, yearly um, convention of uh, amateur astronomers uh, that meet at Green Bank, and we, we, we were detecting a Wi-Fi signal. Uh, coming from our residence hall. So we walked over there uh, and trying to narrow it down, trying to figure out exactly where it was coming from. And it turned out it was coming from one of the guest rooms. And as we were getting towards the door, there's this kid coming out, opened the door, looked at us, his, his eyes just kind of flew open like that. And he rushed back in and then the signal disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then like a minute later, an adult came to the 
door and we told him what we were doing. He said, oh, there's no Wi-Fi in here. <laughs> I said, are you sure? Because we were seeing a signal, or we did, till till the door closed. And they said, no, no, nothing like that. Mm. He was he and, got he was busted, Chuck. Uh, he was busted. <laughs> and uh, actually, this was the guy that, that organized the uh, convention. And the <laughs> next day, he told us, oh, it was someone upstairs that brought their Nintendo with them. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, we believe yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Sure, <laughs> sure it was, Chuck. We buy that. Hey, listen, yeah. it was great having you on the show today and talking about Green Bank, West Virginia. It's amazing just how much we're able to learn from the universe with our technology, even when they're in the off position. Remember, if you have a question about something digital, you can get unbiased advice from someone you trust. America's digital pro, Kim Commando. Just go to commando.com, and in the upper right-hand corner, click on the Be a Caller button. Now, once we get your question and a few details about the question, we'll get your number, and a producer will get back in touch with you to uh, set you up for a call on the Kim Commando Show. We look forward to hearing from you. In just moments, we're going to meet Lee in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Is it possible to fake emails so they fool a forensic expert? Well, that's his question, but he has a much more interesting story about his Filipino bride and how she's now nowhere to be found. One of these days, I plan to compile a complete list of all the ways big tech and government agencies spy on innocent people. But until I can, we have news of yet another and somewhat surprising way you are being watched. I'm betting that you're not a terrorist and not here illegally. I'm also betting that you are being tracked right now by Homeland Security and Immigration and Border Authorities. The Wall Street Journal reports that the tracking happens through hundreds of apps, a few of which are on most people's smartphones. All the apps generate mountains of data on each customer, data that's for sale, not only to companies wanting to market products to you. It's also being sold to the U.S. government, who uses it for only one thing, to track and keep tabs on hundreds of millions of American citizens. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. It's Commando On Demand, where we keep you up to date on the very latest in technology and what's going on out there as far as scams. This next call is about spoofing emails, but there's a much more interesting twist to the story. Here's Kim. Lee in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hi there, Lee. Hi, Kim. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Long-time listener and great admirer of yours. Oh, well, thank you, Lee. You're very kind. What's going on? I have a very sticky problem, uh, and I'm hoping you can help me. If anybody can, I know you will. Here's the thing. Four months ago, I brought my fiancé and her daughter over from the Philippines. We were married two weeks later, and nine days after that, she walked out on me without warning, took the child to the city welfare agency, and falsely accused me of abuse. Okay, whoa, 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 wait, wait, okay, hold on, Lee. You just like said I'm like uh, like no 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 it's not your apolo- don't apologize you just said like this whole big story just in like thirty seconds or less okay so so Thank you. you found a bride in the Philippines yes okay how did how long were you dating her seven years and I made two visits to the Philippines in that time okay to and meet the bride okay and so your your new bride had a child. <laughs> She has a child. Um, the child was three years old when um, I met um, uh, the young lady on the Internet. And she was three years old when I visited them, visited them in Manila the first time. OK, so now, now the child's she is th- ten and a half. OK, now she's ten. OK. And so you bring her over. You guys get married because you're in love. And then right. t- two weeks later, she says that you've been abusing her. She goes to the police. She just disappears. Oh. I wake up one morning, she's gone, she's nowhere in sight, I don't know what's going on, I called the police, I called the FBI, I called everybody, the immigration authorities, I don't know until weeks later what happened. So, well, I thought she was lovely, but I didn't turn out that way, love was one-sided. So I did some digging before I learned even where she was, 
And I found out the sad truth was that um, all there was to her was a ticket to America. And abandoning me and accusing me of abuse immediately got her a green card immediately and put her on the fast track to a U.S. citizenship. Wow. It's uh, from what I've learned, it's a widespread practice in the third world countries. Uh, it's virtually a cottage industry there. It's called marriage fraud. And so oh. what's so tell me more about how she accused you of this abuse. What's going on there and, and how can I help you? Well, a few weeks later, I get a knock on the door, and it's uh, a social worker from the Department of Social uh, Service in Philadelphia, uh, the Department of Human Services, and she presents me a, a letter from DHS, Department of Human Services, saying that I abused I abuse the child. And I was shocked. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, she told me that um, the my wife and the kid were in, in the protection of the Department of Human Services, and that I was being investigated for the complaint. And a few weeks later, uh, the police uh, called me in, interviewed me, and they have charged me with child abuse, which is kind of insane. So I did some more research. I found my wife's divorce papers, her divorce decree from the court, from her first husband, the father of the little girl, showing that uh, she did the same thing 10 years ago, 10 years didn't get before to her first husband, to the girl's father. Okay. who ran off with her baby, accused them of abuse, who ran to the Philippine embassy in Turkey where they were living, and uh, she spent eight months in the embassy, living off the embassy. She got the uh, her government, which is a poor country, she got a government to pay for her room and board for eight months for her and the child, okay. to provide a lawyer okay. to they settle the matter. This is a shrewd one, okay? Oh, my. Okay, so yeah. now... Is is there digital advice? Is that why you're calling me? Yes, ma'am. The digital part comes in here. In addition to charging me with abuse, a few days after that, the detective told me that, uh, called me in for an interview and showed me four sheets of paper, um, copy paper. And I looked at them. The detective says, did you send these? I said, no. I looked in her. They were supposedly emails threatening my wife uh, that my wife said I had sent her. I had never sent her those emails. They uh, <laughs> they uh, were purported to be sent by my Gmail, and they had a stamp on the bottom, sent from my Samsung Galaxy J7. I had sent tons of emails, and not a one of them uh, carried that message on the bottom. The threatening message had my name on the bottom, Lee, uh, and, and the stamp, I guess uh, she didn't trust the police to figure out that I had sent them or, or because my name was on there. So she imprinted, imprinted on the bottom sent from my Galaxy J7. Okay. That's my phone. Okay, so, okay, let, so well, let me let me tell you what you did. OK. It, because this is this must have you just an emotional wreck, right? I'm, I'm, yeah, I, it does. I, I really am. OK. Do you have a lawyer? It, I have a lawyer, and I told him I was going to be calling you and asking you for help okay. with this, and he said, uh, by all means. Okay. You know, I can't, you know, I can't give you legal advice. I can give you common um, sense advice, practical advice. Yes. Okay. Technical advice, I hope, please. Yes. Okay. So let me tell you something. When somebody sends an email, okay, there's a long string of digital bumps and traces along the way, okay? It's not just like an email goes from me to you, Lee. The email goes from me to my internet service provider. It takes a little bit more jumps along the way. And then it finally goes through Gmail. And then through Gmail, it goes to another internet service provider who delivers that to you. Okay. So what I would encourage you to do, and your lawyer may know someone, you're in a huge city, Philadelphia. I'm sure they have them. Is I want you to, I want you to hire a computer forensics expert. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what right. this person does is they will root through your phone. They will root through your Gmail account. They normally know the right way to subpoena these records. There's, you know what I was just talking about, like that little route that it will take from point A to point B? So mm-hmm. they get in there, and then they can time stamp things. Now, the other thing that's really interesting to me is that you, you use the word printout, that these were yes. printouts of emails uh, and no. it said, you know, provided by your, you know, sent by your Samsung Galaxy, you know, because it says on an iPhone sent by an iPhone, you know, and it's pretty common that 
you know, for that seven. Yeah. But you know, printers. I think they're print out. You're, you're, yeah, well, I think they're they're Photoshop. Okay. Well, if they are, okay. Well, then that's you know that's a whole other fraud issue there. But yes, yes. But, you know what you can do is if they are printouts, if they could figure out where that may have been printed, is that you know printers have memory. A lot of people don't realize this. And that's why it's like a really dumb idea just to throw an old printer away because Mm -hmm. they have a certain amount of memory. And that unless you actually reset the printer back to factory defaults, when you throw away the printer, you know, somebody can look at it. And if you had copies of your driver's license, your passport, your tax return, whatever it may be, they would have copies of all that. So a, a computer forensics expert will be able to walk you through this. Um, I want you to make sure that you don't chintz out on this, Lee. Okay. And, you know, somebody, you know, they are going to charge you $500, $1,000. You know, this may cost you $2,000, $2,500 by the end of the day in order to pull all this together. But, you know, where it's going to make a huge difference in where you live. Okay. I mean, whether you live in your house or you live in the big house. And this goes as a, uh, we're advice for any of the men and women. If you're looking for love in other countries, just know it doesn't come without a lot of risk. Lee, keep me posted. If you have trouble finding that forensics person, just give me a call back and I'll do some digging for you too. Of course, you can Google anything and watch YouTube videos from who knows who. But to get Kim's trusted advice, check out the commando community at getkim.com. Again, that's getkim.com. All right. Did you guess the name? Of the third founder of Apple that walked away after just two weeks? Was it George Dayton, Pierre Amadier, Fred Smith, or Ronald Wayne? We're going to have that answer for you coming up in the next segment. Also, Zach King. He's from Los Angeles. He's a filmmaker known for his visual trickery on TikTok. Now, you might say, well, what is TikTok? Because it is huge right now. We're going to find out more about that. And Zach King. Next, on Commando On Demand Insider. New research out this week confirms what I've warned about for years, that more than two hours of social media a day is directly associated with higher rates of depression and suicidal thoughts, especially in girls. Teen boys are not immune, but the girls react quicker and more emotionally and report negative feelings after just 10 minutes of being on social media. Here's why. Social media presents a glamorous but phony life people having fun, going to dinner, traveling to great places. Most teens lack the maturity to understand that these are only quick snapshots of someone else's life, a life that has just as many ups and downs as their own. It's Commando on Demand, where we talk to some of the most influential people in technology, the innovators that shape the future, and trailblazers who challenge and inspire us to do amazing things. All right, here's Kim's interview with Zach King from Los Angeles, the TikTok filmmaker. If you're under 20, you know all about this short video app TikTok. The rest of us, well, we're just getting into it. And when I saw our next guest videos, I just had to share his talents with you. Zach King is the king of TikTok. Well, he's really a prince because he's number two in all of TikTok. And Zach is a filmmaker well known for using sleight of hand editing to bring optical illusions and more to life. His videos truly make people smile. He also has a three-part book series that was optioned by Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. Hey, Zach, thanks for joining us here on the Kim Commando Show. And I've got to tell you, your videos are phenomenal. They're incredible. And I Thank heard you. I heard that you once broke TikTok. What's up with that? We, uh, yeah, we accidentally got, uh, we posted a video. It was like an illusion where I was floating on a broomstick and it was all done with a mirror that made it look like I was floating over the ground. And it was so popular. I had never seen a video get this much traction in my entire, you know, 10 years of doing this for social media, I had over 2.1 billion views or loops. And apparently what that does on a platform is it it hits some sort of number where you have to up from 32 uh, bits to a 64 bit program. So I think we're still, so all of a sudden your number turns negative. So it says like (laughs) negative 2.1 billion loops. And you're like, what's up with that? (laughs) Yeah. Like what did it was all fake or what happened? And so how do you come up with your ideas? Because like, for example, when I was watching the one where you were sweeping the floor and Mm -hmm. then, you know, you turn around and then the mop turns into a dog. I mean, how many of us have looked at a dog and said, you know what? It looks like a mop, right? It's a mop dog. Yeah, Yeah. totally. 
I mean, I think the idea is, uh, you know, when I first started, it was just me pulling these out of my brain somewhere. Uh, but now I get to work with a team of people. And so we all kind of work off this prompt of if we had magic in real life, how would we solve these everyday problems that we're tackling so that that way these stories feel more relatable. They feel more authentic. They feel like um, for many years when I watched classic magicians, it was missing the reason that you would turn the white handkerchief to a white dove. I mean, it's a really cool trick. And I, and I, I'm not a magician, like I can't do that. But at the same time, I always wondered what's the story behind it. So that's, that's our goal when we're making these, these concepts is starting from first that story idea and what trick technique would best complement that. What's your favorite video that you've done? I mean, I really like the ones that tackle these everyday problems or when I, or fears even. When I was a kid, I grew up on a farm and once in a while you would crack an egg and there would be a little baby like chick embryo in there. It was just part of life on a farm. I made a video about that where it was like when I crack the egg and I pop it open for breakfast, it turns into this cute little <laughs> adorable chicken that runs away. How long does it take you to do a video? Because so often you look at like TikTok, YouTube videos, whatever, you know, knowing as a little bit about video as I do... And knowing that it takes time to do this, what kind of time are you putting into these videos? Yeah, I mean, for our videos, they usually take about a month to a month and a half from the moment the idea comes into mind and we start in the writing room, flesh out what the idea really is, what's the best trick that complements that story, and then getting it into production. And, and there's a big time there, sometimes a couple weeks where we we don't know how to pull off the trick. And to me, that's the magic of this whole process is um, like any magician, you know, mine's mine's a little different. I call it di like digital magic, but we still have to reverse engineer. How would this trick be possible? And that takes a couple weeks and, and then we'll finally film it and uh, take it into uh, post-production and try to figure out how to actually, again, once again, reverse engineer like, okay, we thought it was possible. But now we have all these other issues. Um, so it takes us usually, you know, a month to two months for each video. But because we have a good amount of people here working, we can get them out, you know, about two a week right now. What kind of tools are you using? Yeah, so we use a whole range of tools. Sometimes we'll shoot on our, our iPhones, like iPhone 11 is, is great quality for us, but we'll also go to 5D or shoot on the Red. And, and it's funny when we're shooting on the Red or Alexa you know, we're always vertically shooting now, which is so funny. Like even the UI on the, the red monitors, there's no, they're not switching. So we're having to look at it all sideways, to <laughs> change like ISO and everything. Um, but we hope someday, you know, that'll just be a quick fix for them on the UI. And then in terms of, you know, we, we use basic um, computers just like everyone else. I mean, we have a, a couple monster machines for our uh, digital magicians on the team who have to go in there on the computers. Um, and then we use a whole range of I don't know, 15 to 20 different softwares. And we've made some custom tailor-made softwares and plugins at this point for our specific workflow. And when I, you know, when I get to talk to kids who watch our videos, I always tell them like, it isn't really about the gear at the end of the day. Um, you know, that's the fun part about Hollywood. 20 years ago when I was just starting the dream of filmmaking, it wasn't possible to even go out and get a cam. I mean, it was seven, eight thousand dollars for yeah, just the, the home video camera that my my dad wanted to get, and it's like that wasn't possible. But now, on <laughs> even if you have a, a crappy version of an iPhone, you have a video camera and it's and some sort of version of iMovie or editorial software, um, and it's pretty incredible what I'm seeing like ten year olds send me or or fifteen year olds or kids who are going to college to film school. By the time that point is happening in their life, they're already making incredible work if they've um, because the the software and the video devices weren't a limitation like it it kind of was when I was was starting. So I'm I'm really excited to see this next generation of filmmakers and hopefully it allows them to get a head start on their storytelling. I think that at the end of the day is the important part. What is this book series that you're doing with Steven Spielberg? It started because a couple of years ago I would have all these young young kids come up to me too, and it's like the age of four to to six or eight when they come up and they're, I'm eating dinner at Chipotle and they come up and they're like, hey, I love your videos. Like, t teach me how you're magical. Like, what's the secret? How did you become magic? And I used to tell them the whole truth. Like, it's it's this whole post-production thing. There's the editing involved. There's a team of people. It's filmmaking. Kind of pull up the curtain and reveal it all. And they would walk away genuinely sad most of the time. And I realized that wasn't just a fun encounter for either of us. Like me, I knew they were walking away feeling bummed out because it's like a magician never reveals his secrets. And right. that's why it, it was such such an important rule of magic. And so, yeah, I wrote this book series. It's called um, Zach King, My Magical Life. 
And it's like the fictional story to that. I, I wanted a physical thing. I could hand those kids who are meeting me in real life and say, Hey, we'll go read this. Zach's part of a, a magical family, but he hasn't found his actual magic ability yet. And so in the, in the first book, he figures out if he has magic and, and he ends up getting sent to a public school because as, as a magician in the family lineage, if you're magical, you stay at home and you do homeschooling because it, you know, you're learning magic. It's all going to go wrong. But Zach's <laughs> now in public school and that's where, the magic is finally he he re- learns that he is magical. He has a, a special ability, um, but he's got to learn how to control it. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun book series that uh, was optioned by Amblin, and we'll see if it can get turned into a feature film. That would be the dream. You know what? I think it will, Zach. I got a feeling. I just got a feeling that you're like, boom, into the stratosphere. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. You know, be sure to check him out on your favorite social network to see some of his brilliant skits. They really are amazing videos. Just look up Zach King, that's Z-A-C-H King. And that brings us to this week's Commando Trivia question and answer. You know, Apple had three founders. One was Steve Jobs. The other was Steve Wozniak. And the third walked out after just a couple of weeks. Was it George Dayton, Pierre Amadier, Fred Smith, or Ronald Wayne? Well, the answer is D. It was Ronald Wayne, considerably older than Jobs and Wozniak. Wayne was supposed to be the adult in the room in the early days, and I do mean early days. It didn't take long before Wayne became concerned that any debt would become his personal responsibility. So just 12 days after the company's official start, he sold his 10% stake in Apple for $800. Now today, that 10% not adjusted for inflation, by the way, would be worth about $100 billion. Now, I'm sure the first song on Ronald Wayne's favorite playlist is shares If I Could Turn Back Time. And as far as the other names on the list, Fred Smith started FedEx in 1971. Pierre Amadier launched eBay in 1995, and George Dayton founded what would later become Target Corporation way back in 1902. Hey, thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. We appreciate that. It gets this podcast right to your device every single week without any effort. And now here's Kim with some final thoughts. Common knowledge is that Mac users are safer from hackers than Windows users simply because more people use Windows computers, making them the biggest target. There's just one problem. Common knowledge is wrong. For the first time, security threats targeting Apple Macs outnumber threats to Windows computers. 2019 saw a 400% increase from 2018 in Mac attacks. It's not that the number of Macs surpassed the number of Windows computers. It hasn't. But Mac users have been told over the years that most attacks were aimed at the more Windows machines. It just wasn't worth a cyber criminal's time to go after Macs. That was true, until now. If you're a Mac user, protect your computer with good antivirus software today. Because now you are target number one. I'm Kim Commando. Some people say I have a face for radio. Check it out yourself. Watch my global television show on Bloomberg TV on cable and streaming at Bloomberg.com every Saturday at 3 p.m. That's Eastern. It's also posted on my YouTube channel after it airs. That's YouTube.com slash Kim Commando.